All right, hello and welcome um, to uh, the first webinar in our fall webinar series. We're really excited to have this opportunity to present this material to you again, um, and we're really excited to have you all here today. It is uh, going to be a uh, information packed and very dense presentation, but it's going to be really helpful information wise for you all. And so we're really looking forward to it. All right, next slide. Okay, so while we're waiting, I will introduce myself. My name is Mallory Bauer, and I have the privilege of serving as the field representative for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Um, and we will be uh, joined today by Mark Rodman, who is our executive director, and he will be presenting today's webinar. Um, as you are all likely familiar with Zoom, um, but I still want to take a moment to familiarize you with the software so you know how to ask questions and engage with our um, session today. Um, we will be collecting questions in the Q&A box. Um, enter them as you think of them. We will be uh, saving questions until the end of the presentation, but uh, you can enter them whenever they pop into your mind so you don't forget them because that would we wouldn't want that. The Q&A box is located in the toolbar on the bottom of your screen. Um, if it's not there, wiggle your mouse. It should pop up and it's two little chat box and it says Q&A under that and you click on it and type in your question. The chat box is also available um, but we and we will be putting resources um, into that chat box as they come out up like uh, email or addresses or website addresses if you have any technical issues um, you can put those into the chat but put all uh, questions about the content into the q a box this webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a link to the recording these recordings live on our YouTube channel. So if you've been interested in a webinar uh, that we've presented since April and you did not register, but you're interested in learning more, you can go to our YouTube channel and they live there um, and they're accessible whenever it is convenient to you. Uh, so thank you very much and enjoy the webinar. Next slide. All right. So if you are unfamiliar with our organization, we are the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We are the statewide nonprofit that focuses on preservation throughout the state. We advocate for Michigan's historic places that contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place and connection to the past. We are a membership driven organization. So if you are not a member, um, we encourage you to join us in our efforts and you can find out more at www.mhpn.org. Additionally, we are having our fall benefit. It's an annual fundraising event that we have. Um, usually it's in person, but we are doing a virtual event this year where we will have four virtual tours of sites throughout the state. It's going to be really exciting and we have a live auction, um, which will have a lot of really cool things for you to um, bid on and uh, bring home with you if you're the highest bidder. And there will also be trivia if you're a trivia buff. So um, we hope you will join us for our fall benefit. Again, uh, that is November 14th. If I did not say the date, I apologize. All right, uh, next slide. And these webinar series, um, which we have been able to offer at no cost for everybody and anyone uh, to uh, participate in and learn from, they are supported um, in part by an award from the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and a grant from the Michigan Preservation Fund of the Michigan of the Michigan Historic Preservation Network and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We greatly appreciate their um, their support of our programming, so we can help. Uh, you all do historic preservation throughout the state. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Rodman. Uh, he's going to be presenting on laws and organizations, the what and who of historic preservation. Thanks, Thanks so much, Mallory. And thank you guys for being here. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk through the laws and the organizations that work in historic preservation. As Mallory said, this is going to be a pretty dense presentation. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff out to you. Uh, two things to keep in mind. Don't worry about taking notes too much because um, this presentation will be sent to you afterwards so you'll have the PowerPoint presentation. And also at the end, there are a couple links that will link you to most of this information so you can follow up and that type of thing. 
As Mallory mentioned, if you have questions, if you'll put them in the Q&A and we'll try to get to those at the end. We're not taking questions during the presentation because we have so much we want to get through. It's easy to get bogged down into one topic and we don't want to do that. So with that, what I want to do is start talking about preservation. And I'm going to start off just a moment talking about early activities in historic preservation, just to kind of give you a concept of how preservation got started. Preservation is a very strange uh, business, I guess you would say, because um, it's not really cohesive. There's a lot of different things coming at you for a lot of directions, and a lot of it has to do with just the way things developed. So I'm going to give you a few of those things, and then we'll get into the current stuff that we want to talk about so you understand that. Um, and looking at historic preservation, really the first thing that started happening in America with regards to historic preservation was the formation of historical societies. So people wanted to collect artifacts and stories and documents and these type of things so they could share the history of the new states that were coming about um, and the new, new, the new United States with people across the country and with their state in particular. The first historical society was formed in Massachusetts in 1791. But Michigan itself was not far behind. Uh, we've had a historical society since 1828, which is nine years before we became a state, which is pretty impressive that we were already worried about making sure we had that documentation before we were even a state. In looking at people preserving actual buildings and sites, the first publicly owned house museum in the United States is owned by the state of New York, and it was acquired in 1850. As you might imagine, it had something to do with George Washington. It was Washington's headquarters from April 1782 to 1783. If you go to Newburgh, New York, you can still uh, tour this building as a house museum. So it's really exciting that the state of New York took this on so early and they're still working with this property. Now, one of the things that also happened with George Washington's uh, history not long after that was uh, Anne Pamela Cunningham was traveling from South Carolina and had gone to Virginia and had seen the dilapidated state of Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, and she just couldn't believe this was the state of the first president of the United States and something needed to be done about that. So she formed a group called the Mount Ladies Vernon Association, which had two members that were female from each state in the Union, and I'm not sure how many uh, there, there were in the Union in 1858. But um, she formed this group and they did a fundraising campaign to purchase the property and then to rehab property. One of the most crazy things to think about is this organization was formed in 1858 and it still owns and manages Mount Vernon. So if you go to Mount Vernon and take a tour, it is still the Mount Vernon Ladies Association that is maintaining that property and is interpreting it for you. <clears throat> Moving along in 1889, just shortly there afterwards, um, the first statewide historic preservation organization was formed and it had a long name when it was formed. It was the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, Preservation Virginia. And they formed because they wanted to save the Williamsburg Powder Magazine. This was before all the stuff that had happened in Williamsburg as far as the redevelopment because that started in 1926. So we're back in 1889. They wanted to make sure that historic uh, structure was saved. So they saved that and then they turned around and they bought the site where Jamestown had been settled. So when you go to the Jamestown historic site that's managed by the National Park Service, it is actually still owned by Preservation Virginia. So they did some great work there very early in kicking off uh, state groups and trying to save historic places. Now the federal government took a little while to get into historic preservation, but they also did something in 1889. Uh, this is a drawing of Goodman Point Pueblo, which is in Colorado. And when they were doing homesteading, somebody from the homesteading group said, you know, this is an important historic property. There's some really great artifacts here. There's some structures that are Native American we might not want to develop here. And while they didn't protect the site, they just took it out of sites that you could get for homesteading. So that in turn protected it because somebody couldn't go and buy that property and start developing a farm or a ranch or anything of that nature. So um, the federal government was thinking, you know, these things could be really important to us. And I think it's really important they were looking not at, you know, the current American history that had started since the United States had, had come about, but they were looking at Native American history at this point. A few years later, the federal government came in and they actually protected their first site. This is Casa Grande Ruins Cultural Reserve. And, the big structure obviously over it is to protect it now. It was not there when it was uh, first made into a cultural reserve in 1892. 
but they did this to protect the site and they made it a preserve so that you couldn't go in there, you couldn't damage the site and the site was protected. So this was the first time the federal government stepped in to protect a historic site. And again, it's the Native American site. Um, you can visit the site still. It's Casa Grande Ruins National Monument in Arizona. I'm going to jump way up to 1931, and I want to go to 1931 because this is a very important date for people that work in historic preservation, because in Charleston, South Carolina, they created the Old and Historic District. Why did they create this Old and Historic District? Well, after the Civil War, um, Charleston economy had, had become based in tourism and people wanting to see the Old South and what it was like and that type of thing. But all these downtown buildings and homes that people came to see were not protected in any, any way, shape, or form. And Standard Oil came in in the late 1920s and they were going to tear down a historic home to put in a gas station. And this just freaked everybody out because what if everything started getting torn down? What could you do? So it took them a while to get along go along to see if they could figure out how to do this, but Charleston finally passed what they call the Old and Historic District to regulate and have um, some jurisdiction over what happens with the historic buildings within the Old and Historic District. Nobody had ever done this, nobody had ever tried this, but quite honestly, they didn't even know if it was legal. And they just started out there and they started to do that. And so it became the first historic district in the nation. A funny side story about that becoming a uh, historic district is if you see the picture of this on the upper right, it says the Shops of Historic Charleston Foundation. That shop is the gas station that was built because that, that gas station did get built. So that building that you see there is what spurred the first historic district in the United States. It was a gas station for years and now it is the gift shop for the Historic Charleston Foundation. What a great thing for them to do. So now they're preserving the uh, actual building that created historic preservation districts because it was going to be a new building in the historic district. So that kind of gives you some of the things that was happening early in historic preservation. Some of the things in the law will be a little bit earlier than that, but there are things that are still important. So I want to jump back and get those things. One of the things I want you to notice, if you see the image that's on this uh, slide in the uh, right hand column there, this is a book that the National Park Service puts out that lists all federal historic preservation laws, the full text of these laws. I'll give you a link to that at the end, but that if you're ever wanting to look up national historic preservation laws and understand exactly what it says, you can read the law word for word in this book. That this was the last, last time they put this out was 2018, but they do this every so many years so that it's current and you have the current information. I don't think any of the laws have changed since this was put out. So it would have good information for you if you are looking to find out about federal historic preservation law. One of the first things that uh, happened in historic preservation as far as a law was the Antiquities Act of 1906. And this came about because there were a lot of people that were out there looting sites across the West as the United States were expanding because there was nothing to keep anybody. It's like finders keepers at that time. If you walked onto a site and you, you saw an artifact and you wanted it, it was a great, you know, historic uh, pot or something like that. You just took it with you because there was no rules saying that you couldn't. So the Antiquities Act would pass. It did several things. It did put in a permit system for archaeological or preservation work. Um, it was penalties for damaging or removing these prehistoric and historic artifacts. And the thing that we hear most about is it gave the president the ability to designate public lands as national monuments. The one thing I always like to say when I'm talking about the Antiquities Act is the president can't go get somebody's private property and say it's a national monument and the government take it. It's not allowed. It has to be already federally owned or it has to be in a deal that somebody works out to transfer the property to the federal government because they want to do it. So there's always this terror that, 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 that the president is going to come in and declare your neighborhood a his, national historic monument and suddenly uh, you don't have any control of your home. That's just some, not something that, that can be done. Um, the next thing that happened in historic preservation was the Historic Sites Act in 1935. And what it really came in and did, it was the first time the federal government said that historic sites and buildings and objects that are nationally significant are important to the United States and we need to protect these. And so it's the first really thing that went out there and said the government does care about historic preservation and we need to keep an eye on that. It created the National Historic Landmark Program. Um, the National Historic Landmark Program is the list of the most nationally significant sites 
in America. And there's 42 that are in Michigan. And um, so we're very fortunate to have that many things in Michigan that have been nominated and have been determined to be National Historic Landmarks, because that is not easy to do. 42 is actually a fairly large number for a particular state. It also directed the Department of Interior to survey, preserve, rehab, protect, acquire, and operate um, nationally significant historic and archaeological sites. So they were starting to look and see what was out there. It was even historic because nobody had done a survey. There was no list. There was no National Register of Historic Places. So this is what kicked in that process and got that process moving. So why some of this might seem antiquated because we've got the National Register and that stuff now, two laws I've talked about in 1906 and in 1935, those laws are still in effect and they're still active and they're still a National Historic Landmark Program and there's still the ability for the president to declare national monuments, some of which are done for cultural reasons. So with that, I'm coming to the big law. The big law, and if you take anything and understand anything from the presentation today, if you're not familiar with it, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed in 1966. And this is the law that we really, really want to key on as far as historic preservation. The National Historic Preservation Act basically came into being for two reasons. And those two reasons are shown here on the screen. If you look on the left, one of the programs that was going on from the federal government was called urban renewal. Because at the time, the concept was the way to improve your downtown and make it re and to get people there and to make things happen again, was to go in and tear down all these old buildings and build new. As people had come back from World War II, they had moved out into the suburbs, they were not going into downtown, downtown was becoming vacated, the buildings were in bad repair, and people wanted new and they wanted the suburbs. So, that, so the um, government was coming in and tearing down these buildings. So many times when they were tearing down these buildings, it was not a plan, it was not like we were going to tear down this building and build something there. It's like, we got to get rid of that building, it's in bad shape, so it's better just not to have it. So buildings were getting torn down right and left. If you look at the right picture, that is the building of I-496 through Lansing. And what was happening was with the Passage of Interstate uh, System Act, people were going in, the government was going in, and they were just plowing through neighborhoods to put in interstates because the quickest way to get from point A to point B was a straight line. And if that went through properties, so be it. That's where we're going to go. And a lot of those went through low-income and minority neighborhoods because you, you know, the, the local government wasn't upsetting their friends if they were doing the low income of the minority people. So they would just plow right through that. Nothing you could do taking down historic buildings left and right. So these two things were really, really affecting how things were happening in America, but they were the way that things worked at the time, urban renewal and interstate development. Well, the National Conference of Mayors got together and in one of their conversations was, is this really the best thing that we should be doing to revitalize, to take care of our economy, to our history, those kind of things. And maybe this is not what we should be doing. So they commissioned a study called With Heritage So Rich. And Heritage So Rich looked at how historic preservation was being done in Europe and how they had made progress with that and how it had been a benefit to their communities. And then it looked at how can we do better in the United States? What programs and policies could we put into practice that would help with this and maybe be something that you could do besides for the urban renewal and those type of things. So the uh, National Conference of Mayors wrote this book and then they went to Congress and said, we need you to do something. We need a National Historic Preservation Act. And I think that's what's so exciting to me is the National Historic Preservation Act was not something that the government said, we need to regulate this and we're gonna put this on the American people. The mayors from across our country went to Congress and said, we need to protect our historic resources. We need a National Historic Preservation Act. So it was the grassroots that got the National Historic Preservation Act passed. And I just think that's really exciting to know that because a lot of people I think feel like it's top down. It's the federal government telling you what to do. No, the American people asked for this act. So it's great. It, um, they asked for this act and it passed. What did it do? Well, it created the National Register of Historic Places. That did not replace the National Historic Landmarks Program because you can be on the National Register without being a National Historic Landmark. The National Historic Landmark is the most nationally significant properties in the country. The National Register can be places that are just significant to your community, but they're very significant to your community. 
So it created the National Register of Historic Places. It also created state historic preservation offices because the federal government thought, well, the states are really gonna know what's important to their state and what's historic because they're more local than we are. So we want this process not to be top down. We want to be something that has a network. So they created the state historic preservation offices to work with the historic, National Historic Preservation Act and the things that it needed to do. They also um, developed the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which is a cabinet level position, um, which reports to the President of the United States, and it advises the President and Congress on historic preservation for the country as a whole. We're gonna talk more about the Advisory Council when we get to organizations. It also created what's known as the Section 106 review process. I'm not going to give you a, a whole overview of the Section 106 review process because that's more than a webinar just in itself. But Section 106 is the section of the National Historic Preservation Act this piece was originally in is why it's called Section 106. But Section 106 basically says that if a property is owned, if there's a project that's funded, if the project is permitted, if the project is licensed um, or requires any kind of action by the federal government, that it must be reviewed to see if that action will affect historic properties. And if so, is there a way to get around hurting the historic property? And if not, how do you mitigate the, the effect it's gonna have on a historic property? So anytime there's any federal involvement in a project, there is a 106, section 106 review and that comes from the National Historic Preservation Act. It all, the National Historic Preservation Act also created, um, I shouldn't say created, I should say required, every federal agency to have a preservation program. So every federal agency, it doesn't matter whether it is the Department of Interior, it can be the Department of Commerce, it can be the Department of the Treasury, any department within the federal government must have a federal historic preservation officer that looks out for the historic assets that that particular department oversees. So you'll see a lot of different agencies that are looking at their, their historic assets and trying to figure out, especially through the 106 process, how to deal with them. So this program was put into place in 1966 and the states were told, well, you gotta have a state historic preservation office, you have to have a state historic preservation officer, you'll be working with the National Register, you'll be doing 106, all these type of things that you were gonna to have to do, which was really a federal mandate with no funding. So if, as you might imagine, there was a lot of pushbacks from the states, like you're making us do all this, we don't have the money to do it, this is ridiculous. So in 1976, the National Historic Preservation Act was amended and it created a fund to help fund these historic preservation offices. And the Historic Preservation Fund is funded through taxes on offshore, oh, I, I never can say this, I get tongue tied, offshore oil leases and those taxes go into a fund and they fund the state historic preservation offices, they fund grants for historic preservation and they fund the work of the National Park Service in the historic preservation area as far as management of that program. So it's a very important fund uh, that, that brings money to make sure historic preservation takes place. You get to 1980 and one of the things the National Historic Preservation Act was supposed to do was to bring everybody in the United States together on historic preservation it was championed by the U.S. Conference of Mayors and who was left out? The local governments. Of all things to be left out when it's the mayors pushing you to have a National Historic Preservation Act, but the local governments themselves. So in 1980, the um, National Historic Preservation Act was amended again and it added the Certified Local Government Program, which gave a way for local governments to participate in historic preservation from the ground level all the way to the national stuff that's being done. So um, that kind of completed the last time they made a large amendment to the National Historic Preservation Act. And these are the programs that it kind of oversees at this point. But again, if we talk, if anything else that we talk about, this is the act you really need to know because most of what's done at the federal level is related to the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. We're gonna move to 1976. In 1976, the, the inner city still had all these problems with historic buildings that were abandoned and the costs were just so high to go in and rehab them as opposed to building a new building. And so from an economic development standpoint, the federal government was looking when they did tax reform to talk about how do we help get something to happen with all these vacant, dilapidated buildings in our downtowns from you know, small rural communities to large urban centers. This was a problem across the nation. How do we deal with this? 
And so the Tax Reform Act of 1976 included a provision that gave accelerated depreciation for expenses for rehab of historic property, which mean you can write off your books faster than building a new building, which you know would be something that would help people with their taxes as after they had done a project. So maybe they would look at rehabbing a building instead of being new because they would save money in the long run. So that was helpful. But in 1981, there was tax reform again. And this time they decided, okay, let's take this um, credit that we have for selling, I mean, this, this, this provision we have for accelerated depreciation and make it a credit. So they develop a tax credit for the rehab of commercial properties. In 1986, when tax reform passed again, they looked at this bill and they made some adjustments and it set the current 20% rate that we have for the Federal Historic Tax Credit for commercial property. So that 20% that you see today was set in 1986. In 2017, when tax reform came along again, uh, they looked at this bill and it was like one of these things, do we cut tax this tax credit because we're trying to reduce taxes? Do we keep the tax credit? How does this work in the tax reform? And after a lot of back and forth, what was ended up deciding and what was done with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was they said, we're gonna keep the 20% credit However, we're gonna make people that take the 20% credit spread it out over at least five years. So you can't take more than 20% of your 20% credit that you earned off your income taxes um, in any one year. So 20% per year for five years. You have 20 years to take the credit, so you can spread it out however you need to. You just can't take more than 20% in any one year. So keep in mind if you're looking at tax credits. In 1979, um, they passed the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. And if you look over at my archaeological, archaeological that's in the title and the way I spell archaeological throughout this presentation, they're different because the federal government does not use the second A in archaeology like most groups do. So the title is correct. It's not a typo. Uh, but you'll see archaeological with an A in most anything else that we have in here because that's the way most people particularly use that. So it goes in and takes what was in the Antiquities Act and it fur further defines the permitting system of how that work, permitting system for archeological work on federal lands. Um, it details the penalties if you're trading in antiquities, if you're selling artifacts, those kind of things. And also defines that Native Americans have the ownership of the archeological resources on their tribal lands. So that's clear and everybody knows who, where the ownership belongs. Now, I've talked about the laws that I wanted to mention, but I also have to mention a Supreme Court case that's very, very important. So this is not a law, but this is an interpretation of the Constitution, and it's very, very important for historic preservation. So I want to throw this into the law discussion at the federal level. When you look at historic preservation law, one of the things that happened was the city of Charleston and so many groups thereafter now had historic districts, including New York City. But honestly, nobody really knew if they were legal. There had never been a determination whether you could really regulate uh, for cultural and architectural resources. And so this test came, test came from something that happened in New York in 19, that happened in the 1970s. They, they went to the Supreme Court in 1978. So this is uh, Grand Central Station, which I think even if you haven't been there, or even if you don't know exactly what it looks like, everybody's heard of Grand Central Station. Well, Penn Central Railroad owned Grand Central Station. And they decided that they weren't making enough money off of Grand Central Station, they could make more. So they proposed building a tower on top of Grand Central Station, as you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. That was their actual drawing. This is what they wanted to do. And they presented this to the New York Landmarks Commission and the New York Landmarks Commission said, no, this is a historic building. This is an inappropriate addition to this building. This does not work. This is not fit this historic building. So they told them no. So Penn Central sued them, and this case eventually made it all the way to the Supreme Court, and they basically said that the city of New York did not have the right to take away their rights to do what they wanted to with their bill, and this was a taking. So it was a taking of a property, which you can't do according to the U.S. Constitution. So the Supreme Court took a look at this, and they determined that reasonable local landmarking was not a taking, and this could be done. You could regulate for cultural and architectural reasons, and that was the fine thing that you could do, as long as you weren't taking away all economic use of the building. So had the uh, New York Landmarks Commission said, Grand Central Station has to be a museum, 
or it has to be open to the public, you can't put any businesses in there, it would have been illegal. And since they were saying, you can continue to use Grand Central Station as you're using it, it's used as a train station, it has all these concessions in it, you're making money from that, and we're not prohibiting you from doing that, then this would be fine. So it was not a taking according to the Supreme Court. So it really did uphold the government's right to designation and regulation of historic sites and districts. So when you're working with a local historic district now and they're doing their regulations, everything they do is legal because of the Supreme Court decision back in 1978. So something that was very important that um, is referred to on a regular basis, especially if somebody tries to sue someone for regulation on their historic property and um, says it's a taking, you know, the, the Supreme Court says it is not within parameters, obviously. So with that, I wanna move along to state law and talk a little about state law and, and what we have here in Michigan. So one of the first things I wanna talk about is the Michigan Historical Commission Act in 1913. It establishes the Michigan Historical Commission and it gives them the uh, authority and directs them actually to collect, arrange and preserve materials and objects that are important to Michigan's history. And so this is really what started the Michigan History Center that we have today is this historical commission went out and started doing collections for things that were important to Michigan. A lot of it was you know, state documents that they were, they were putting in archives and keeping to make sure those were maintained for future people to be able to do research. But there was also objects they were collecting from all over the state and they began to put these objects together in collections that they displayed so that people could see this. This bill itself has been re repealed and replaced. It was done so in 2016 but it still directs the commission to do basically the same sorts of things. A little bit different language, a little bit different direction, but same sorts of things. In 1929, they passed the Aboriginal Records and Antiquities Act. And this was a lot like um, the federal government looking at the Antiquities Act, and they were worried about people going on to state lands and grabbing artifacts and claiming ownership of those artifacts and all those type of things. So it also set up a permit system for working with um, exploration and excavation on state owned lands. It set the penalties for those. Like the one that I mentioned before with the um, Michigan um, Historic Commission, Historical Commission, this um, legislation has also been re repealed and replaced. It was done so in 1994, but it still basically gives you the same type of things as far as the regulations go. It's just been reworked a little bit and rearranged in law and written a little bit differently, but it, it says the same type of things. We get to 1955, and the governor at that time really wanted to make sure that people were learning the history of Michigan and understanding what was important to Michigan. So one historical marker program. So this act was passed in 1955, and it established the Michigan State Register of Historic Sites. So it developed criteria for and the management of historic markers and the sites that these markers represent and interpret. So. Um, if you're looking to put a state historical marker in front of a building, the process is still the same as it was in 1955. It's still laid out the same way, and it does put the property on the State Register of Historic Sites. Moving along to 1970, something going back to historic districts is very important, is Michigan passed the Local Historic Districts Act. And what that did was it enabled municipalities, townships, and counties to establish local historic districts, and it told them they needed to do this through a historic district commission. So it talked about how that um, district commission must be created and how it must manage the processes of designation and also the management of those properties. Now with designation, it is not something that the local historic district commission does. There are study committees that are appointed separately that do that and it lays out that process as well. So it's the whole local district law that we have today is based on the law from 1970, because for a local government to actually undertake any activity, that activity has to be enabled by the state government. This is the act that enables them to do local historic districts. So for a municipality, a county, or a township. In 1980, uh, the state passed the Great Lakes Bottomlands Preserve Act, and it allowed the state to create um, bottomland preserves which are in the Great Lakes, the bottomlands of the Great Lakes. And it's there to protect all the historic resources that are at the bottom of the Great Lakes. And since that time, there's been 13 preserves created, totaling 7,200 square miles. Just like the archeology span of something that's on land, there's a permit process for exploration and recovery. 
and it also sets penalties for violations of possessions or artifacts. This was also repealed and replaced in 1994, and it was actually put together with the Aboriginal um, Act and Antiquities Act into one thing. So they're kind of, because they, they address a lot of the same things. So if, instead of having the duplicative language, it put them in a thing together. And obviously there's different pieces and parts that refer to one or the other, but it, it was a way to combine these things and not have the du duplicity within the uh, laws of the state of Michigan. So in 1998, the Historic Preservation Tax Credit on the federal level was really doing well and making a lot of things happen, but there still need to be a little bit more incentive. So a lot of states in the late 80s and the um, early 90s were getting into the act, um, passing state historic preservation tax credits to match the national historic preservation tax credit. So in 1998, Michigan passed their Rehabilitation of Historic Resources Act and it would give a credit for up to 20% for commercial. And this is what's different from the federal residential buildings as well. So there's a 20% credit for both of those. However, when Governor Rick Snyder came into office, he decided that tax credit was just not the way he wanted to do tax policy. So he eliminated almost all the tax credits that Michigan had. So he did not have an anti-preservation bent. He didn't like tax credits. So what he did, he repealed a bunch of tax credits with PA 38 of 2011. So currently there is no state historic preservation tax credit in Michigan. As you may or may not be aware, there is a campaign to get tax credits to come back to Michigan so that we have that opportunity again here in the state. Um, it's Senate Bill 54 and House Bill 4100 that are, that are being heard through the legislature at this time. I'm not gonna go into all the details of where that's at, but if you want to know more information on that bill, um, you can go to the website www.miimpact.com and that'll give you all the information about the tax credits. The thing that's really, um, that you really need to know about this is those two bills either have to pass by the end of the session, which ends at the end of this year, or they would have to be new legislation introduced to try to get the tax credit back starting in the legislative session in 2021. So we're really hopeful that something will pass um, by the end of this year so that we have a historic preservation tax credit in Michigan again. Now, when I said that, you do have a historic preservation tax credit. It's just the federal credit. There's no state credit in Michigan at this time. Moving along a couple years later in 2000, there was a push to say, we need to do some work on these lighthouses that we have. And there are a lot of upkeep with these lighthouses and they haven't been maintained in a number of years because they're not being used like they've been used in the past. So there was a lot of deferred maintenance. So an act was passed that would establish a grant program to assist the lighthouses. And so this grant program is an annual program that provides grants to lighthouses to do repairs um, on those lighthouses and do the maintenance that needs to be done. The money for this grant fund comes from lighthouse license plates. So if you go to get your license plate renewed and you get one with a um, Michigan lighthouse on it, you're contributing to this fund to help bring money and funds to rehab historic lighthouses in Michigan. So that's, that's my presentation on the laws of historic preservation, both at the federal and state level. And I realized that was an extremely, extremely quick move through those. So you'll probably wanna take time to look through those more. Again, there's the federal guide and there's also a link to our website that'll get you to those state uh, laws as well. So at this point, I want to move along to preservation organizations, because there's a lot of preservation organizations uh, nationally and in the state, and get an idea of who does what, who you need to talk to, according to what your needs are and what you're trying to find out um, is extremely important. So we're going to go through these. I'm first going to go through the national organizations, first talking about the governmental agencies that are involved in historic preservation, and then we're going to move on to the nonprofit groups at the national level. We'll do the same for the state after that. So let's start with some of these organizations at the national level. As we were talking about um, the National Historic Preservation Act, one of the things that it did was create the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Believe it or not, it is an agency at the cabinet level of the federal government. So when you look at the departments, whether it's the Department of Agriculture, uh, the uh, Department of I'm trying to think of another one. <laughs> all, all the Department of Commerce, all the different departments that you have, this is one of those large departments that you have, Department of State, all those kind of things. There is the 
the um, advisory council of historic preservation at that same level. And what this agency is charged with is federal policies and programs in historic preservation. So they're really dealing for the most part with the work the federal government's doing in historic preservation. They're not out there doing work with the general public because it's really focused on the federal government. However, because the federal government is the one that either owns the property, is um, giving funds to the um, project, giving licenses or permits to the project, then they regulate Section 106 and the processes with, with Section 106. So typically how the general public gets involved with um, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation is through Section 106. If you go to their website, they have a great guide on 106 and how you can participate in the importance of how it works. So uh, typically you read through so many government guides that are really bureaucratic, you're like, what are they talking about? This guide is really helpful and useful. So if you want to learn about 106, you do want to go to their website and check out that information. They also uh, have run in the past a program called Preserve America, which promotes heritage tourism throughout America, trying to, to help um, provide economic development um, through heritage tourism. That program has not been funded since 2008. And so um, there's not a whole lot of money in it right now. But if you had, in the past, if you had gotten declared a Preserve America community, then you could apply from a grants to do interpretive signage, to do tourism walks, to do um, heritage programs and festivals that would bring people to your community. But unfortunately, that money is not available at this time. You know, it may come back at some point because Preserve America program still is in statute. It's just not funded. The next federal uh, agency I'd like to talk about is the National Park Service. And if you're not familiar with preservation, this may surprise you that the Park Service itself is um, the agency that works with the um, most of the National Historic Preservation programs on the federal level. Um, the National Park Service manages both the National Historic Landmark Program and the National Register of Historic Places Program. If you're going to be listed on either, the Park Service is the agency that's going to ultimately approve that and put you in those lists. They also have manage the Historic Preservation Fund. So they're giving out money to uh, the State Historic Preservation Offices to operate, but they also have grants programs. Um, Save America's Treasures, which is a program that gives money to um, properties that need rehabilitation through grants on um, historic properties. It can be, you know, a house, it can be a commercial building, it can be a nonprofit building, it can be anything that has significance nationally that really needs a lot of work for some reasons. They have a grant program that comes out that they, they fund every year that you can get money to do projects on. It's pretty significant. You can get up to $500,000 for one particular project. And I know a number of projects that have been successful in getting money from that program. They also have programs like African American Civil Rights Grants. So they're looking to document and preserve the places that my dog, Clue. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, African American Civil Rights Grants are looking to survey, document, and actually rehab places that were um, that important in the civil rights movement all across the country. And in fact, that grant application should be coming out in the next few weeks for the next round of those. So there's also there's these different types of grants that you can get through the through the National Park Service for historic preservation. Um, the National Park Service um, also manages the rehabilitation tax credit. So if you're looking for a federal tax credit for rehab of a commercial property, the National Park Service is the ultimate decider of whether you meet the standards for you to be able to get the credit for the work that you've done. Um, they also manage the certified local government program, and they're the ones that make a local government certified to participate in historic preservation and be eligible for other grants that they have called certified local government grants, which local governments can get to do historic preservation projects. One of the nice things that the, that the um, that the National Park Service done, does is preservation briefs. And these briefs help you learn how to do things on historic buildings. If you want to learn how to um, repair and protect historic masonry, it'll tell you that. If you want to look at how to redo your windows, it'll talk about that. If you want to understand how to do a storefront on a commercial building, it'll talk about the best way to look at storefronts, interpret, and rehab those. So um, very, very helpful information. Um, I think there's 50 some of those now. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but it's a great resource that you can, when you're getting ready to do a project, you can look through and find information. They also have the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. 
And that is a center down in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And what it does, it takes all these different materials that are building materials and it tests them and it tests ways to preserve them and protect them. So when you're going in to do a rehab, you understand the best way to treat and maintain these particular materials. So it's a great research center for historic preservation and historic rehab. And then the last thing I'll mention with the National Park Service is they do have natural, national heritage areas, which are areas that are not like national parks, but they, they provide money for local communities and usually these regions and not a single community to promote something that's important to that community. Like here in Michigan, we have the Motor City National Heritage Area, which is a national park, national heritage area, and they get money to promote um, history that has to do with the automotive industry here in Michigan. And they can give that out to local museums and groups that are doing interpretive and preservation projects throughout the state. Now I want to move on to the nonprofit organizations that are at the national level. The one that you may have heard about um, is the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The National Trust for Historic Preservation was founded in 1949 and it was actually chartered by the federal government and the federal government gave money to support the National Trust for Historic Preservation because Congress at that time felt it was extremely important for there to be an, a group out there advocating for historic properties in a way that the federal government couldn't do that. And so they formed this organization. And in 1995, the National Trust for Historic Preservation actually severed their ties with Congress. They're still a nationally chartered organization, but they're no longer funded by Congress. And you think, why would they lose that? Why would they want to lose their federal funding? Because the National Trust did that intentionally. They did that because when they went to advocate for historic preservation at Congress, the pushback was always, don't mess with us on this. We'll take away your funding. And they felt like they really couldn't be independent on um, advocacy issues for historic preservation as long as they were being funded directly by Congress. And so they chose to become a fully uh, private nonprofit organization at that time. So the National Trust, what does it do? Um, the National Trust has a number of programs and I'm just gonna run through a few of those. They have a program called National Treasures where they find areas in the United States that are in danger of being lost that are significant to the nature, the, to the, significant to the nation as a whole. And with those, they provide support and advice on how to save whatever the problem is. It may be that there's you know, no maintenance going on. It may be that there's a threat because somebody's gonna tear down something. Any, it might be a natural environment threat. Whatever the threat may be, they work to try to help mitigate that problem and to save that particular property. Likewise, they have the 11 most endangered places list they put out every year. And with this endangered places list, what they do is they're really being a PR firm for people who have endangered places saying, yes, this place is important and yes, it needs support. They don't go in and work with these properties like they do the National Treasure. They're just trying to get word out that, hey, there's a historic property in this location that needs some help and needs your attention and tries to help those groups that are working with those properties get attention and help for those particular places. The National Trust has historic sites across the country that you can visit. They're museums, house museums that you can tour and learn the history of. Um, so those are important if you're traveling to look for those. Um, you get a benefit if you're a member. I think you get in for free. Um, they do preservation advocacy at the national level. And so they're in the halls of Congress advocating for historic preservation. Um, they also have a historic preservation grant program. And as Mallory mentioned at the first of this um, webinar, they actually have a fund specifically for projects in Michigan. It's a small fund and they don't typically give out more than $5,000 at a time but it is a way to get, get things going and, and make things happen. They do not actually fund physical rehab with that, um, that money, but they will fund like architectural drawings or construction documents if you're doing a project. They will fund surveys. They will fund workshops like we're doing today because we are funded by this fund from the National Trust. So if you're looking for preservation grants, you may wanna look at that. If, you're, if you just need something to kind of get you started and get things kicked off, that $5,000 can be helpful. They do an annual preservation conference every year and it moves around the country. This year, like everything else, it's virtual. And if you haven't signed up, it starts tomorrow. So you can go and join the National Trust for Historic Preservation, their conference, by going to their website and signing up to join the conference beginning tomorrow. They also do National Historic Preservation Awards and those are presented at the conference each year. And they're for exemplary projects and programs from across the country. It's always inspiring to go and see those and do that. If you're doing a project 
and you're proud of it, I would tell you, you definitely want to apply to get an award from the National Trust. They do a fantastic job in developing a video that you can use later on to promote your project and the things that you're doing. Uh, the next group that I want to talk about this a national nonprofit is Preservation Action. And Preservation Action is a grassroots lobbying group that lobbies at the federal government for, for preservation friendly legislation. Um, right now, they're really working hard to lobby for changes in the historic preservation tax credit to make projects on smaller buildings possible. Because if your project is less than $2 million, it's really hard to get investors if you need those to make your project work because the way the tax credit is set up. So this group is working to change that so it's easier to use investors and do projects with, that are smaller, um, whether it's in a small community or in a neighborhood in a larger city. Um, this group, as I said, is, is grassroots, so they depend on um, membership and, and support from everybody. They have a big auction that's their fundraiser every year, and that is actually tomorrow night at seven o'clock. So if you wanna help out Preservation Action, I'll give them a plug. Uh, go to their auction tomorrow night and uh, see what they've got. Got a lot of great things. In fact, they're auctioning off um, a uh, registration for our conference. So if you want to come to the Michigan Historic Preservation Conference later this year, um, excuse me, next year, then you can go in there and buy that registration from the, one of their auction items. Another group I'd like to mention that's a national preservation organization is the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. And this is a group that is set up specifically for historic district commissions across the country to come together to learn how to, to do things and learn the best practices and also to share information and work together. So they have information and technical support for the commissions. They do training and education. They have a program called CAMP where you can do a webinar for your historic district commission that'll teach you about whatever the subjects are that you want to because what they do is they have trainers from across the country that are specialized in different areas of things that you would do it for a historic district commission, whether it be legal issues, whether it be the Secretary of Interior Standards, whether it be how to conduct a meeting, how to do survey, all kinds of different things like that. And you can pick the instructors you'd like for the topics you'd like and host a camp in your community. Typically, these are done live uh, on site, but like everything else, they're doing these virtually at this point. They also have an annual conference. It's every other year. They just had their conference this year, so the next one will be 2022. If they're able to do it live, it will be in Cincinnati, so it'll be fairly close if it's something you'd like to travel to. The next group I want to mention is the Archaeological Conservancy, and they're set up specifically for archaeological site protections, and they do a couple things that are really important. Number one, they regularly purchase sites that are endangered that are important archaeological sites to preserve those sites. Typically, they don't like to hold on to those sites, but they'll hold them until they find an agency that can preserve and maintain those sites, and then they'll do a transfer to that, that organization or that agency or that type of thing. They do hold some and, uh, and maintain those themselves, but that's not typically what they want to do. They also um, put preservation easements on these properties to protect these archaeological sites. They do a lot of work with easements and everything, but they're the group, if there's an emergency and somebody's willing to part with the property, um, you know, but they're going to sell it. They're not going to give it to you. They're going to sell it. If you want to buy it, they'll sell it to you instead of selling it to that developer. Then this is the group that can come in quickly and take care of that and then arrange for what happens to that property and the long-term care of it, you know, afterwards. So that's the federal, uh, I guess national, I shouldn't say federal because some of them were nonprofits, but the national um, organizations that I wanted to chat about. And now I want to take a minute to talk about um, the organizations in Michigan. The first one I want to talk about is the State Historic Preservation Office, and it's part of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And it gets a little confusing because there's a lot of things that um, the National Park Service handles that first have to go through and be monitored by the state historic preservation offices because of the way that the National Historic Preservation Act is written. So if you're going to, if you want to list a property in the National Register of Historic Places, you do not apply to the National Park Service. You apply to the state historic preservation office. They can approve that application and send it to the National Park Service or they can deny approval of that application and not send it to the, to the National Park Service, which 
in, in, in that case, if you think my property can be on the National Register and the State Historic Preservation doesn't like it, you can appeal to the National Park Service, but you have to go through the State Historic Preservation Office first. If you're doing a Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credit project, to get that tax credit, you're going to submit your application and the first approval you're looking for is from the State Historic Preservation Office because like the National Register of Historic Places, the uh, State Historic Preservation Office is the first step for histor federal historic preservation tax credits. Again, they can approve or they can deny, and if it's denied, you can appeal to the National Park Service. Um, one of the things that the National uh, Historic Preservation Act encourages um, states to do is to do surveys of historic resources in their state because you can't preserve what you don't know exists historically. So you got to survey it to know what's out there. So um, they manage survey programs. So if you're doing a survey project and you want to meet the standards of the federal government, you would work with the um, survey coordinator at the State Historic Preservation Office to do that survey. Um, they also apply for some grants and they have grants and they're, and they're hiring people to do surveys. They don't, they haven't, they can't do much because they don't have a whole lot of budget to do survey, but they are doing surveys from time to time. They have an African-American civil rights survey going on in Muskegon right now. Um, through a grant they were able to get through the National Park Service grant program. The State Historic Preservation Office also oversees a certified local government program. So if you have a local government that has a historic district commission or doesn't have a historic district commission, but you'd like to get certified for historic preservation through the federal government, you would apply to uh, the State Historic Preservation Office to get their approval before it goes on to uh, the National Park Service, just like the tax credits and the National Register. And some people say, you know, why do you care to be a part of the certified local government program? Well, first of all, it's kind of like the good housekeeping seal of approval, saying that you're doing thing right, things right in local historic preservation, so you can feel good about the way you're doing things. But I think probably the reason that most people apply for the certified local government program, government program is there are grants that the federal government gives money to the state historic preservation office office to give out that can only go to certified local governments. Those can be for survey, they can be for interpretation, they can be for rehabilitation. So if you're looking for money from the State Historic Preservation Office and you're a municipality, you're a township, or you're a county, the Certified Local Government Program is a way to get in and get some money through those grants. It doesn't guarantee you the money you have to apply for those grants, but you're not eligible for them without being a certified local government. There are many certified local, I mean, there's many local governments that have historic district programs in the state that aren't certified local governments. And the State Historic Preservation also works with those um, local districts to help them manage and support those districts and the activities they're doing as well. We talked about the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program as far as the laws. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office is the agency that manages that as well. So if you're looking for grants for a lighthouse, you would go through the State Historic Preservation Office to get that grant. They also have the state archaeologist in their office. So if you're doing archaeology and you have questions about archaeology, you can call the State Historic Preservation Office and talk with the state archaeologist can, can tell you how to go about it or how the law affects you or what permit you may need for something and that type of thing. And finally, um, as part of the National Historic Preservation Act, they have to work with all Section 106 reviews in the state of Michigan. They're required to. So, any of these things that happen with federal land or permitting or funding from the federal government in Michigan that goes through Section 106 review, the State Historic Preservation Office is going to look at it and they're going to say it either is or is not affecting historic properties. And if it is, what can we do to mitigate the problem that is happening if we can't get around um, destroying or creating an issue for this historic property? So they look at over uh, 3,000 of these every year. So they are extremely busy going through Section 106 review and helping with those projects that have federal money and permitting. Um, moving on, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation also has a couple other programs that work with historic preservation, and I want to mention those specifically. Uh, the Michigan Community Revitalization Program. If you're doing a project in a community on a commercial building, um, the state has both grants and loans it can give to help you with that project. So um, you apply through the Michigan Community Revitalization Program. Um, if you look on the MEDC website, they have information about that program and who to get in touch with, because it's one of those things you don't just fill out an application and put in. 
you want to talk with a representative from that department about your project, the best way to go about it, the best way to put your information together, and whether you're kind of looking at loans or grants, what the opportunities may be. But it is a great program for, you, for people that are doing commercial projects throughout the state. Um, the second program they have is called the Michigan Main Street Program. In 1980, the National Trust for Historic Preservation kicked off a program called the Main Street Program, which a program is to use historic preservation to promote economic development in downtowns across the country. And each state has an affiliated coordinating organization that helps make this possible. In Michigan, that's the Michigan Main Street Program. So if you're looking for assistance with your downtown, whether it be just preservation or economic development, looking into this program is a way to help, you know, that for you to learn and get information on how to do those projects. They also have some funding for Main Street communities to help you do those projects in your downtown. Again, if you go into the MEDC website, you can learn more about Michigan. Main Street is a great, great downtown revitalization program. Another preservation organization that you want to be familiar with um, in the state is the Michigan History Center. This is a uh, division of the Department of Natural Resources, and they have 12 museums and historic sites across the state. The one that the picture you see here is the uh, Michigan History Center in Lansing, um, which is their main museum. But again, they do have um, affiliate museums and historic properties across the state. Uh, they maintain the archives of the state of Michigan. And they're also the uh, agency that manages the Michigan Historical Markers and the State Register of Historic Sites. So if you've got a uh, property you'd like to get listed as far as a state historic site, have a historical marker, this is the, um, is the group that you would talk to uh, for doing that type of thing. Um, I want to go through and talk about the uh, nonprofit organizations and um, what they do. Obviously, the first one I want to talk about is the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, because that is us. And uh, Mallory told you a little bit about us at the first, and if this is the first thing you've attended with us or you've just attended these workshops, to let you know, I'm going to go through real quickly some of the other things that we do. Um, we are an advocacy organization. We have a lobbyist that works at the state capitol with us. And right now, our big thing, as I mentioned earlier, is historic preservation tax credit. We're trying to get that reinstated. So we'd love for you to go to that website, miimpact.com, and learn more about that and contact your senator and your representative about the um, historic preservation tax credit. Um, you know about our workshops because you're attending one of those. So we do workshops. Um, we, we do one webinar a month. We also do um, workshops for individual organizations and communities. Uh, we usually do those in person in those communities. Right now, those are being done virtual. If you've got a topic you'd like for us to talk about, please uh, get in touch with Mallory and she can help work out a program for you guys. We don't do all the programs we, ourselves. We bring in experts for different areas of historic preservation to do that. It also includes hands-on workshops. So if you're looking at masonry or plaster work or window repair, you can help put those workshops together as well. We do an annual conference every year. Our next annual conference is in May of 2021. It will be virtual. We are taking session proposals for that right now. So if you have a good session you'd like to propose yourself, we would love for you to fill out our session proposal and get that in while we're working to put our program together. Um, this is something that's well attended and uh, we appreciate people coming to that. And we think you'll enjoy it should you do that. Um, we also do an awards program every year and like the National Trust, um, we do videos that you can take with your awards, you can put up on your website and really promote the project that you were doing. We should start taking um, the uh, applications for our awards um, in November. And so when that's being done, that information will be out there. And we'd love if you've got a project or a program you've been working with, for you to put in an application to receive an award. We have a low interest loan program that we have to help people get started with programs. And we also have one that actually helps with physical rehab. So if you're looking for money to get a project started as a rehab project, or you're getting you're starting a project needs some help with the actual financing of it, please contact us and we can talk to you more about our loan program. We have an easement program to protect historic property. So if you're looking to protect a property, we'd love to help you work with an easement. And we also do rehabilitation projects across the state. We're currently working with five houses in the Russell Woods Sullivan Historic District in Detroit. Moving along, the next uh, organization I'd like to talk about um, is the Historical Society of Michigan. 
Um, this is, like I said at the very first this presentation, a very old organization. It's been around since 1828. They do three different magazine publications that you get if you're a member. So if you're looking to learn more about the history of Michigan and get their publications, it's a great thing to do. They actually hold three history conferences every year. And so you can look for those. They're held in different locations across the state. Their last one was virtual. Uh, their next one may be virtual. I don't think they have made the decision going forward about how that may be. But that would be something to look forward to. Uh, Michigan History Day is for uh, education, is for K-12 kids, and they do, they host that every year. They also do history tours, so if you're looking to learn more about a particular place, they may have a tour that they're giving for that, so you can look and see what their tours are. They provide assistance to local historical societies, so if you've got a local county or city historical society, they can call the um, Historical Society of Michigan, discuss whatever issue they may have and how to do programming or operations or organizational stuff, those type of things. And they also run the Centennial Farms Program that recognizes farms that have been in existence within the same family for more than 100 years in Michigan. It's a pretty big accomplishment if your family has had a farm for 100 years and it's still operating, and that's what they honor with that particular program. I want to mention next the Michigan Architectural Foundation. It's a foundation that's set up to honor the architectural history of Michigan and architectural legacy. They give out grants each year for funding of historic preservation projects. It's a pretty competitive grant process, but they do actually give money for physical work on historic buildings in the state. And they offer college scholarships for students that are looking to um, study architecture. There's the Michigan Barn Preservation Network. And the Michigan Barn Preservation Network is what it says. It's set up to work with farming and ranching buildings in Michigan. They also hold an annual conference. They do tours of barns. They have an awards program. They do a barn school where they teach you about barns, how they're built, how you work on barns. They do barn and farm surveys to figure out the history of the barns and, and their importance to a community. And they do teamwork and timbers, which is actually getting out and working on a project on a historic barn or a farm or ranch building here in Michigan. I want to mention the Michigan Archaeological Society. The Michigan Archaeological Society is kind of interesting because it's a group that has a core and central focus, but it also has seven chapters, which they really are the ones that are out there doing the work in those seven individual chapters. Um, they have an annual meeting. They produce a uh, publication, the Michigan Archaeologist. They'll do workshop and field schools. So if you want to go out and learn archaeology, you can go out with these guys and do it, because this group is not specifically for archaeologists. It's for people that are interested in archaeology, and archaeologists are involved, and they will help teach you archaeology if you go to a workshop or a field school, you do not have to have an archaeological background to participate. They also do an awards program that you can participate in as well. Now, looking at local governments and looking at local preservation organizations is a little bit different because we could go through every single little detail of all these different ones and we really don't have time for all that. So I just kind of want to give you an overview of what those are. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a certified local government program here in Michigan. There are 32 certified local governments. You can get a list of those by going to the SHPO website. There's also an additional 46 historic district commissions that are not certified local governments. So in Michigan, we have 78 local historic district commissions, and 32 of those are certified local governments. We also have 55 Main Street groups in uh, Michigan, which is pretty important. Now, it's interesting because 30 of those Main Street groups work directly through the state, but Oakland County has its own Main Street group that coordinates with the state, but it's its own oversight group. And they actually have 25 communities within Oakland County that are part of their Main Street group. So that gives us the 55 that we have for the Main Street communities. Now, there's a lot of different historic preservation organizations across the state in local communities. And this is not every single one of them. There's a few smaller ones that may be out there. These are the ones that are really active and doing things within their community. And these, I want to be clear, these are not historical societies. Because historical societies, they may do preservation from time to time, but they're looking at collecting documents, uh, you know, collecting photos, 
telling stories and writing the history of an area where these groups that we mentioned here are focused on historic preservation, whether it be a building, a site, archaeology, those type of things. So they're, they're looking at the physical things that you're doing with a particular area. So one of our partners is Brick and Beam Detroit, which helps teach people how to take care of their own property. So it does workshops on all kinds of things, from windows to masonry, the plaster repair, to how to assess what's wrong with your building, all those type of things in the Detroit area. Copper Country Preservation is up in the Keweenaw Peninsula, and it's a preservation organization to help them preserve those sites that are associated with the copper mining in, in that area of the state. Preservation Detroit obviously is um, focused on um, preservation in the area of Detroit and the surrounding communities. Uh, preservation Lansing is looking at the capital city and how they preserve things here. Um, I could mention specific projects about these groups. I'm going to not do that at this point unless you have specific questions. And then we have other groups across the state. There's the Plymouth Preservation Network, there's Preservation Saginaw, Ypsilanti Heritage Foundation. All these groups are out there working and doing historic preservation in the local community. This is extremely important because all preservation is local. And the best way to get preservation done is to have a local group working toward that and have a group of supporters there. It doesn't have to be organized like these groups are, but local support is what makes preservation happen. So we're very fortunate to have these organizations working in their communities and making preservation happen there. So that is my presentation on both laws and organizations, but I wanna give you a couple resources before we start taking questions at the end here. Um, if you go to our website, www.mhpn.org, under the resources section, there is a section on laws and statutes where you can find the laws that I've been talking about today and more and learn about them and, and get the information of what's actually in those laws. This section has a, a direct link to that federal booklet that I showed you, which is a P, you can get it in PDF form. And so if you go here and you want to get to that federal law, you just go there and click on that link. But there's, all, there's links to a bunch of state laws there as well. Um, we also have a, web, uh, a page on our website that is for our partners. So if you're looking like, gosh, you know, I need to talk to Ypsilanti Heritage Foundation about something. I don't know how to find them. You can Google them, of course, but you can go to our website. You can go to the partner section and hit that and go straight to their website and get information on them. Um, it, it'll, it lists all the ones. If you're not sure where one is, you can find them in that list and know how to contact them. One of the things that's tough as um, historic preservation has really developed into a profession and a career is historic preservationists love to throw out acronyms and terms. And if you don't work in historic preservation a lot, you're like, I have no idea what these people are talking about. So um, Michigan Historic Preservation Network, along with the State Historic Preservation, State Historic Preservation Office put together a historic preservation terminology guide that defines these acronyms and terms. So instead of you, you know, trying to Google it or trying to talk to somebody, and I don't really understand what this means, at least you can read a definition of what it is. It doesn't mean that every definition is going to be clear and it's going to make sense to somebody that doesn't work in this every day, but it does give you a little bit of direction of how to go. If you look on the right hand side of this page, there is the link to that uh, Historic Preservation Termin Terminology Guide on our website. So with that, Mallory, I think I am ready for questions. All right. Whew, that was uh, quite the marathon sprint. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we currently don't have any questions coming in. So I'm sure people are kind of processing everything that came in. So we'll give, uh, we'll give it a few moments for some questions. Um, but I guess one of the things, you know, if um, you're looking at preservation in your community, um, why do you think it is important to understand, have some of these legal backgrounds? Like, why, why do you think that this is important for people to know? Well, you know, it's like every other profession, there's parameters of the way that you do things and there's correct ways to do things and not and ways not to do things. And so, you know, when you're looking at a project and you're trying to figure out which way to go, understanding the laws, what's available to you is, is extremely important. So I think the laws are important. I also think knowing what organizations you can go to, because if you, if you you're like, well, wouldn't it be great to be on the National Register of Historic Places? And you might, first of all, think, 
well, if I can get on the National Register places, then they can never tear down my historic building and it'll always be protected. Well, if you start reading the National Historic Preservation Act, you'll find out that it's an honorary listing and that it doesn't actually protect the property. You also find out if I want to learn more, more about having to get on the National Register, if you know you have to go to the State Historic Preservation Office, office to do that, it saves you a lot of time in Googling and searching and trying to figure it out. So the more you know about who does what and the laws, the more helpful it is and to actually work your way through the process. Because, you know, unfortunately, historic preservation is like everything else. It probably starts out somewhat simple and then it gets bureaucratic and knowing where to go and where to find the information and who to talk to is always very important. Right. Right. I also feel um, understanding some of the legal um, precedents on the, you know, the local, the state and the federal level also reflects how historic preservation is important to us as a society that, that we have taken the time to, to put some of these um, laws in place. Um, so as a, as a preservationist, that is sometimes that is encouraging for me to look back on and reflect because uh, I think that it, it shows that historic preservation is important to our communities and it is something that uh, is important to continue to include in our planning efforts. Well, you know, I think that's one of the things that, that I think is important, especially when I first started off talking about the early activities, is trying to show people that Americans have cared about historic preservation almost since America has been here. And to how it progressed, like this is what we're doing, this is what we're doing, and now we need to codify this, we need to do more, I think is really important. And, and one of the things, and I've already stressed this, that I think is so important, is so many people look at any federal law as something that the uh, feds are telling you you have to do, and they're trying to regulate me and this type of thing. And to know that the National Historic Preservation Act is actually a product of the mayors across this country going and saying, we want this done, I think really makes you look at it a lot differently. This is something that's been important to Americans, not to the federal government. And so I think that's really important to see in historic preservation. So I really like to point that out because I think, you know, that's not something that most people understand at all. The you know, National Historic Preservation Act is a federal law. The federal government's telling me what I have to do or, or how to go through these processes, but we ask them to do it. And I think that's really interesting. Right. Um, so one thing in the in the midst of our conversations as a as a field recently, um, you know, many of our understandings and, and past legal actions in historic preservation have uh, skewed towards preserving a, a certain segment of society. Um, you know, we talk about uh, some of the the wealthier houses get get saved, and and some of our uh, disenfranchised communities. Um, are those that uh, end up under the wrecking ball. Um, do you have any thoughts that you'd want to share or conversation or a little discussion on that that you'd like to mention? You know, I think that what you're saying about historic preservation is really following how society has been as a whole in the United States since its founding. I mean, you know, everything that you've looked at has been from the um, the saving the history of the white male and what they've done to make America great and all this stuff and the, and the people that really have played into America from all kinds of different facets is not looked at if you're not in that one group because that was the group that was the leaders that was the people that were on top you know right or wrong that that's that's how that that came about and so I think the society is looking to change that as we move forward that's something that we've got to correct in historic preservation as well I think one of the problems that that you have and in historic preservation is that when you're looking for the, the pristine examples of things and the things that have been well maintained, even if they weren't high style, many of the disenfranchised and lower economic level communities, they haven't had the money to preserve these properties and to take care of them. So when you're driving into them, you're like, oh man, that's in bad shape. Or they've done repairs just with whatever, and what, however they could. So they may not have done what we consider it being proper. And so therefore it makes those um, areas harder to get listed on the National Register, be it a district, a site, a building or whatever, because they haven't been maintained to the level that show you what these buildings look like when they were you know, originally built historically. Um, the National Park Service is really taking a look at that because when you're looking at designation, um, 
one of the things you look at is the integrity of it. Does it still look like it did historically? Is everything in good repair? You know, it's not, I mean, great repair, but you can tell what it was historically without having to do too much. Like, well, I think this was there and this looked that way or whatever. You can kind of look at it and those parts and pieces are there. And you find a lot of places with rich, rich history that don't have those qualities when you look at some of these disenfranchised areas. And so the Park Service is looking at that integrity issue and how do we figure out how to work with that so that we're not negating, um, listen, these properties in the National Register and honoring them as well, because you know there's a lot of important sites. And I think the other thing that people look at sometimes is many times that you had a site that was you know, built by a white male and it was something that a white male had used, but over time, other communities moved in and took that property over and started doing some, and they changed that property to meet their needs. And again, they may not have had a whole lot of money to, for those needs. So they didn't do it as, like, like we would say, a historic preservationist should do it. So how do you deal with those changes and the fact that it was never a pristine thing when it was actually significant to the, to the population you're wanting to recognize? So there's a lot of ways to look at that. And I think as people start looking at these disenfranchised communities for so many different ways, it's important for historic preservation to do the same. Right. Well, those were my, the, the topics that I kind of wanted to bring to the, the conversation. We haven't had any questions come in. Um, so hopefully that is uh, a reflection of just how uh, well explained everything was and not that everyone's <laughs> very overwhelmed from all of the information. Um, but if there are no questions coming in, um, again, we will be, oh, uh, <laughs> um, the, um, we will be providing a recording, uh, a link to the recording to our YouTube, and I'll also be putting together a one pager that has many of the links to the organizations and, and places where you can find the laws um, as a resource for you in the future. Um, Mark, do you have any say, final co comments? Yeah, Mallory, I was just going to say, if you have any, if, you know, if you need more information while you're waiting on that, uh, Mallory, to get something out to you, you want to look at something in particular, do go to our website. And at the very top above the little line that has our name on it and everything is, is a tab that says resources. If you click on that, that'll direct you to a lot of these resources and others that may help you in historic preservation. We tried to put as many things up there as possible, not necessarily things that we're doing as Michigan Historic Preservation Networks, but to get you to other organizations and other programs that can be helpful to you as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this and hope it's been helpful and thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Yeah, thank you all and um, keep an eye out on our website um, and our social media presence. We will be having a monthly webinar going uh, into this next year. I don't have uh, November solidified yet, but in December we're going to we're working with the Michigan Barn Preservation Network on a webinar, which I'm very excited about. So keep an eye out for those and um, thank you again uh, for joining us and we will see you at a future webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Thank you, everybody.